I can't help but think about the best being yet to come, but only if you're saved. For you, the best could be right now, as good as it gets, never get any better. You say, why? If you're lost, you spend an eternity in the devil's hell, you come out at the great white throne and you get judged, and then you get cast in the lake of fire and the smoke of your torment rises up forever and forever and forever and forever until God dies. Preacher, when does God die? He doesn't. So for us that are saved, we are a messed up group, I admit to you. One of the things that people forget is, is that even though we're saved, we're still humans. And even though we're saved, we still have problems. Doesn't the Lord always allow us to have enough fleas on us to remind us of the dogs that we are? None of us are perfect yet. But one day, you know what's going to happen. The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the yeah. voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. When I was seven years old, I came home and I, my mama had uh, roast beef, mashed potatoes, English peas on the plate, gravy, biscuits that were there, iced tea. I can still see the sweat running down off the glass of cold iced tea on a hot day and it's running down there. My mama had to use a plastic tablecloth because me and my brother would turn stuff over all the time and uh, those kind of things. That was before the whooping and then after the whooping we'd clean up the mess and try not to do it again. <laughs> But I remember sitting there and my daddy looking down at me and I'm picking around in that. I mean, that's a, that's a meal fit for a king. And I remember him looking over at me. He said, what's the matter with you, boy? And I said, uh, um, I'm not real hungry. He said, why not? Are you sick? And I said, no, sir, I'm scared. He said, what you scared about, boy? And I said, uh, I'm scared I'm going to go to hell and burn. Man, it's like a hollered fire in there, man. My mama grabbed my brother and sister and the little old dog over in the corner and took off running out of the room. And my daddy reached under there with that big old hand and pulled that chair. I can hear it sliding across that terrazzo floor. Pulled me right up there to the corner of that table right there. Tea glass sitting right here. I see the ring sweat beginning to build up there, a little condensation there. And he said, well, let me show you what the Bible says, son. And right there on the edge of that corner of that table, I got down there on my knees and my daddy on the other side of the table and I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And from, since then, my time's been fixed. Now, that's the purpose that I have in life. My purpose in life is I'm a saved individual. Have you always lived right? No. Well, what have you done? Thank God for the blood and none of your business. <laughs> Are you always perfect? No. I have struggles the same way you have struggles. Yeah, but you're a preacher. It doesn't matter. You get older, certain things fall by the wayside, but other things come around. I mean, you start getting old, don't you struggle more with anger and bitterness and frustration and aggravation? How about complaining? Man, you ever be around old people much? You, after a while, you hear they, they're griping about everything. It's my, shoot, man, just let me get out of here, jump off the bridge or something. And, and they always get a gloomy side of things. And something's always hurting. My knees hurting, my back's aching, you know, my corns is giving me a fit, you know, and my skin looks like crepe paper, and my belly and my chest done lapped over my drawers, and amen. But my soul's fixed. Yeah. And so some of you may be here visiting, you may be thinking to yourself, what in the cat here is all these people gathered here in a church thing on a Sunday, and uh, it's running right past dinner time and stuff, and you got a whole dead pig back there ready to eat, and this yeah. and that and the other. Uh, because we have meat you know not of. Amen. There's things to us that uh, make a difference. And uh, I can't thank you enough for your hospitality. I'm pretty much in the is south, but I had to go south to even get more hospitality. You folks have been absolutely, unbelievably hospitable. And uh, me and the boys feel very much like we're very much at home here. We have a new home now in Australia. Amen. I don't know when it'll be that we ever get back down here alone to, to see you. But I can tell you this, part of our hearts will be here with you Amen. because of your kindness. Take your Bible, if you would, please. I'm going to let you stand for a minute or two to get you started on something here. And I'm with the preacher. If you feel like you need to go, you won't offend me. I understand the way life is nowadays, that people have other things that have to go. Well, don't worry. We won't talk about you. Well, until you leave the building. <laughs> 
and then we'll talk about you and they'll be saying, man, why didn't you stay here and endure the tribulation? <laughs> By the time I'm done today, some of you who were pre-trib will be thinking, oh, I don't know, maybe we just went through the trib, you know, with, with him preaching. But I, I want to give you something that'll uh, help you to maybe understand uh, this statement uh, resonates with me at this moment right now. Uh, the, the ability to be able to sacrifice Isaac will never happen until you're broken yourself. And the, God uses broken things. Did you ever know that? Yes, sir. God uses broken things. If you've been around life at all, very long at all, you know what you know? Somewhere along the line, things have happened into you and you've gotten broken all to pieces and you think because this happened or that happened or whatever the tragedy is that took place, you think I'm no longer of any value. I'm no longer of any good. I've been broken. No, you're in a great position because God uses broken things more than he does whole things. When the Lord's sitting there at the Last Supper, you know what he said? This is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. God likes to use broken things. I get the privilege of preaching to some people every now and then. You know one thing I find? Everybody in there has their break, breaking point. Every single person. You think you're hard, you think you're tough, you think you're rough, nothing will break you, and then the Lord will come along there and allow something to happen in your life, and your heart will break like an egg underneath the giant's heel. I mean, boy, it'll snap you like a twig. And you know what can happen? You can stay in that broken state for a long time. It'll affect everything about you. And I want to show you something about a broken vessel in the passage here today and maybe give you an illustration of some things and show you how God can get glory even out of a broken vessel. Notice, if you will, chapter 14 of Mark and verse number 3. Chapter 14 of Mark and verse number 3. I love to hear pages turn instead of buttons click. Man, I like the sound of that. It kind of sends a cool breeze up here. We all are flipping those pages. I can feel the breeze. And being in Bethany, verse 3, the house of Simon the leper, he sat at meat. There came a woman in the having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikener, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, in the originals, it says, shut up. I, I'm just kidding. I don't believe in the originals. Y'all thought I was reading the Living Bible. I am the King James. <laughs> and they murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. Amen. For you have the poor with you always, and whosoever ye will, that may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. And she has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken for a memorial to her. Brother Boyder, do you pray? Would you and ask the Lord to help us? Dear Lord, we sure do appreciate the opportunity to be in your house once again. Lord, sure to be able to appreciate the opportunity to get to hear some preaching. Lord, pray you fill our preacher up right now. Lord, thank you for the chance to be down here and just to get to fellowship with some other brothers in Christ. And Lord, pray you just watch over us now. Lord, pray the hearts and minds of the congregation would be open to receive the message. Lord, pray yes. for any lost soul that might be here. Lord, they'd leave changed. Yes. Lord, they'd come to a meeting with you, Lord, in the crossways, and they'd accept you as their Savior. Lord, pray for the hearts that are broken this morning. They'd find some help. Amen. Just pray and ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. The value of broken things. I remember I was preaching a meeting up. You might even be familiar with it, preacher. It's way up there in the mountains in North Carolina. It's called Mount Airy, North Carolina. Used to be an old preacher up there named Preacher Lackey. He, they called him the upside down smiler. He would, he would look at you and he was smiling, but his, his fr it was always looked like a frown. And he talked down, you know, like, like this all the time. He just always looked like he was frowning. Great man of God, loved the Lord, believed the book, preached like he believed the book. And I was up there one time, and I was a, just a sprout kind of getting started, and they allowed me the privilege of preaching up there. I was a policeman at the time, and I preached to the kids in the school and gave them a bunch of illustrations of things I'd seen and done. And, and I got finished with that thing and was talking about some things that had got broken. And there was a little old lady that came up there. She wasn't big as a minute. She just a little old tiny thing. And she came up there, and I remember, 
remember she grabbed a hold of me to get my attention, tugged on my lapel on my coat. She says, can I talk to you a minute? And I said, well, yes, ma'am, you sure can. And I kind of squatted down there so I could listen to her like that. And she says, uh, you know, I just won't tell you a story. And I said, well, all right, yes, ma'am, that'll be fine. And she says, you know, uh, around Christmas time, you know, we had this real pretty candelabra and we put a candle down in that thing and, and we'd light that thing at Christmas. Oh, it was so pretty. I mean, it just shot, made a green tint all around the room. And I said, well, ma'am, that's really, really nice. She said, I ain't done yet. I said, yes, ma'am, pardon part me. You know how sometimes you kind of get in a hurry? Sometimes when you're talking to your wife, they're flying around the airport and you're waiting for them to land. <laughs> so now I just got you. And then you're kind of like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's happened to me before. <laughs> Wait till she gets in the hangar before you interrupt her. You say, why? Because she's just, she's just getting ready, you know, just, just waiting to hear it. And so I said, well, yes, ma'am. She said, well, there are a bunch of hoodlums come over to the house, you know. We had the kids over and all for Christmas dinner, and they's running through the house. I tell them all the time, don't be running through the house. And they's running through the house, and they knocked that thing off, busted it all to pieces. I said, oh, that's a terrible thing. I ain't done yet. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, okay, I'm not getting the correlation. Y'all probably are already getting it. She said, Jed, you know, Jed, he, he's a good fella. He, I, I love him. I love him to death. I, I don't appreciate his snoring, but I do. I do love him. I, I, I love him. And I, I said, well, you, well, yes, ma'am. And she said, oh, Jed, you know, he got him some glue. He sat down there at the table and he worked on that thing like he was working on a, jig, a jigsaw puzzle and he put it back together. He, she said, Lord, have mercy on him. That's the Southerner's way of saying what an idiot. She said, God bless his little heart. You know, he done the best he could. And she said, it didn't look near like it did before. She said, it's one of the ugliest things you've ever seen. She said, it was terrible. She said, it was all glued. You could see the glue and you could see all the cracks and all that sort of stuff. And I said, well, yes, ma'am. I said, but I guess he done the best he could. And she said, yeah, he did. And she said, but it just never looked the same. It was just a, it was just a mess. But, you know, as we always do, she said, you know us Southerners, we got our traditions, you know, and so we sat down at the table and put it at the middle where we always done, and, and we got the match, Jed got it, and he lit it up, and she said, the strangest thing happened, and I said, what's that? She said, that's the prettiest thing we'd ever seen in our life. She said, every place where it was cracked and every place where there were shards missing, the light from inside began to dot the walls and we began to see that thing in a whole different light. She said, it was ugly to look at until you put the light inside it. And she said, once that candle got it, she said, you know what? You know what the first thing is comes out at Christmas time? That old broken candle. We love that candle. She said, it didn't mean much to us when it was whole. She said, but now there's a story attached to that. I thought to myself, my goodness, man, that's been probably 30 years, 35 years ago that I heard that little old woman. I'm positive she's on the hillsides of glory now and dead. But you know what she did? She taught a young preacher something right there. You say, what? The value of a broken vessel. Sometimes it don't look as good as it used to look. And sometimes it's all twisted up. And sometimes it's all messed up. And sometimes it's all scarred up. But you know what? When that light gets lit up inside it, that thing never looked any prettier. You don't realize the value sometimes of a broken vessel. I remember coming in from the midnight shift one night and I got off there at 7 o'clock in the morning and I made a beeline to the house and I got there to the house and I went in there. Back in those days you could turn on and find some preaching and that kind of a deal. And I turned it on and there was a preacher that was up there preaching. I sort of recognized his voice, I thought, and I'm getting off my uniform and my gun belt and stuff and get ready to take a nap there and, and those kind of things. And I hear this guy in there and he's up there and he's, he's singing Victory in Jesus. And he's slobbering all over the pulpit and all over stuff. And I mean, you can't half hear what he's saying. And then all of a sudden he says, stop, stop, stop. And then I went out there and I thought, man, what in the world is going on? I recognized the guy. The guy had been at my dad's house a few weeks before that and bawling his eyes out about some things that were going on and scared to death that his children, if he had children, were going to wind up like him. That boy was twisted up like a pretzel, man. I mean, turned all which ways like that, and his mouth was all twisted up. And when he talked, every time he talked, I mean, just slobber would come out of his mouth. And he's up there, and I mean, there's thousands of people that are listening to him, and thousands of people there in the choir quit singing and everybody else. And I remember him leaning over that pulpit and all twisted up, and he made this statement. He said, I got your palsy. What's your problem? 
That boy's name's David Ring. He's an old Southern Baptist evangelist, and he may not have all of his doctrine straight, but I thought to myself, you twisted me up like a pretzel like that guy. You think I'd let God's light shine through me like that? Boy, God got a hold of my heart that day, and I thought to myself, that man's a real man. I mean, I've been out there, and I've faced some things and done some things and been around some bad guys and stuff like that. I don't have the courage that guy's got. You say what? Using his broken vessel for God. You say why? God shines bright through broken vessels. God likes broken vessels. You ever been broken before? You ever been torn out? You want to look for reasons why? But you say, why? God's trying to use you. God's trying to use the hurt, the pain of your past. Listen, if you want to really minister to people, ministry comes from misery. And power comes from pain. Paul said that I may know him, the fellowship of his suffering, and the power of his resurrection through the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul said, listen, you want to be great? You got to be little. You want to be on top? You got to be on the bottom. You want to be all powerful? You got to be broken, but boy, that's a hard thing to do. You say, what? Well, there's a memorial made to this. Could you show me anywhere in all those people in the Old Testament, all those great preachers, all those great prophets doing miracles? I mean, miracles like causing the Red Sea to split, causing the Jordan River to split. I mean, cities falling down by people just marching around them, and the cities coming crashing down. Absolute unbelievable miracles that transpired and took place. Where's the memorial? There's not any. You come along into the New Testament, you look at the apostles that are in the New Testament and they do great signs and wonders and miracles and they heal the sick and they're there when the dead are raised and they watch lepers get cleansed and people that can't walk, walk and blinded people to be able to see. They've even witnessed and seen Jesus Christ transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. And guess what? Where can you tell me? Where's the memorial? There's not one. Then all of a sudden the Lord comes along and He finds a little old girl like this. What's her name? Mary. What do you know about her? Not much. She never preached a sermon. She never led a Sunday school class. She never sang a special. She didn't write a book in the Bible. All you know about her is, is a couple of places. One place, she's sitting at the feet when Martha's upset because she's not in the kitchen. In another place, she's over there sitting at Jesus' feet and uh, the Lord has to call for her because Lazarus has died, what they were singing about tonight or this morning. And they're up there singing about Lazarus and uh, Lazarus dying and the passage there has to do with the Lazarus that's down in the grave and the Lazarus in John 11 is her brother and she's sitting at the house and the Lord has to call for her because he recognizes something. Mary's not at my feet. And now they're sitting at supper. It doesn't say she made biscuits. Doesn't say she made cinnamon rolls. She had to be in backslidden condition if she didn't make cinnamon rolls. <laughs> if you're right with God, you've got to learn how to make cinnamon rolls. That's called manna from heaven. Amen. Amen. You look it up. It's in the original. It's a trilateral root word of the Hebrew there somewhere. <laughs> but it's in the original text. <laughs> But at any rate, you see what happens with her. What happens? Now think about this for just a minute. She's over there. They're having a men's meeting. Now, I'm talking Jewish custom. These are men that are over there with the Lord. They've gotten kind of accustomed to being around the Lord. Uh, they're just the Lord sitting at the table with them. They take it for granted. You ever take it for granted? You ever sit down and read your Bible in the morning and just take it for granted, just you and the Lord talking? You ever sit and get ready to pray? You're literally entering into the throne room of God. You're up there talking to the creator of the entire universe that holds heaven and hell in his hand, who literally named all the stars. I love the passage where it's talking about he created this, he created this, created this. Oh, and he named the stars also, kind of like, you know. Uh, you ever realize how many stars are up there? He named every one of them. I get to looking at that stuff and I get enamored with that and I think to myself, how many times I sat down like the apostles and say, oh, it's just Jesus. We having dinner with who? Oh, it's just Jesus. We have dinner with him all the time. We, we sit around, talk all the time. You know, me and Jesus, we've been everywhere together. Been on the boat with him, walked on water with him, talked with him, healed my mother-in-law. Maybe a little bitter about that one, but at any rate, he's, he's done a few things along the way. Uh, you know, but do you ever get an idea? The next thing, it's just another dinner with Jesus. And Mary's over there thinking to herself, you know something, Jesus is going to be at the house. I wonder if there's something I could do, if there's something I might be able to, to do for him. I, he's done so much for me. If it hadn't been for him, I, I don't know where I would be. I don't even know why it is that he decided to come by our way. I, I wonder if maybe I could do something. And he's just really been a help. And she looks around there and maybe sitting up on top of an armoire there is her 401k. It's her, it's her retirement. It's her guarantee. It's her assurance of knowing for a fact that uh, because of Jewish custom, if Lazarus died, Mary and Martha become the property of whoever can afford them. That's insurance about being owned by somebody else. 
and having to do that because that was Jewish custom. And she looks up there and said, boy, that's my rainy day and that's my savings and that's my, my retirement and I'm going to do this. But, you know, the Lord's not going to be here much longer. He's about to be gone. And I, I, I'm thinking, I wonder, I wonder what I could do with that. And she gets up on a little stool there and she kind of gets on that little three-legged stool like you milk a cow with and she balances up there and she gets a hold of that thing. She looks at it and blows off the dust, you know, and that old alabaster on the outside. Alabaster is not like people teach you. They teach that it's a real soft stone. No, it ain't. It's hard as marble. I mean, it's hard as intended. And you know what it is? It's intended to keep whatever's inside of it where you can't smell it. It's intended to maintain the, the, the smell of the perfume. I guess you'd know about that. But here, here's the thing that they do. They, they wind up taking that and she takes it lid off. She goes, oh man, that smells good. <laughs> she, I forgot how much this stuff costs. The Bible says it's very costly. And she puts the lid back on there and brushes it off. And she said, I know what I'm going to do with it. And puts it underneath the robe there. And down the street she goes. Dinner's in full swing now. Lunchtime, you may call it. Supper time is what it really was, is in the evening. And the guys are sitting around and doing their thing and talking to Jesus and kind of taking that stuff for granted. And they're just around and having them a good meal and, and those kind of things. I don't know if I was Peter, he's probably sitting there going, you know, uh, any of you guys, uh, have you guys been in any uh, storms lately or anything like that? And Mark looks over there and Matthew and says, oh boy, here we go again. He's going to talk about when he walked on the water. Walk? Did you say walk on the water? <laughs> I, well, well, I mean, I don't, want to, I, don't want to, I don't want to steal God's glory or nothing like that. But I mean, I'd, you know, but since you brought that up. No, I'm, I'm just saying, if you were Peter and you walked on water, you think maybe you might want to like, let that kind of come up there? I don't know what they're talking about. But I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fixing to be the Last Supper, you know, the Last Supper. That's the one where the Lord said, everybody that wants to be in this picture, get on this side of the table. <laughs> Why are y'all laughing and y'all aren't? <laughs> You're closer to the food. It's like, don't feed the animals or something. <laughs> but, but let me say this to you. I don't know what happened, but I know this. I know that it was against custom. It would against the rules. It would have been against the, the protocols for her to interrupt the men's meeting. Women were less than animals. I don't mean any disrespect, but you got to understand what it is that she's about to do before she ever gets to box breaking. She has a lot of hurdles that she has to overcome. A lot of traditions, a lot of things the way they've always been. And here the men are, they're the apostles, they're the preachers, they're the students that are being taught. And they're sitting there with the Lord and the doors open up. I can see Martha come stick her head out of the kitchen with flour on her face going, Man, what are you, Mary, what are you doing? You're supposed to be here in the kitchen with us doing dishes. We're not letting you cook because you can't, you'll burn the biscuits. But could you, could you, you, you need to be in the kitchen. And somebody else says, what is she doing now? I got no idea. Every time Jesus shows up, she just has to wind snuggling up around his feet. I got no idea what her problem is. And she starts to walk into that room. And all the guys looking over there at the room, the doors open up. They're like in a Baptist church. When somebody comes in late, you know, everybody kind of turn around and look. Y'all have experienced that, I see. And then all of a sudden, all the chairs in the back are full. And in a Baptist church, all the chairs in the front, it's like, bring them all the way down front, you know, for them to be able to sit there. Well, she comes in there, and everybody, I guarantee you what they're looking for is what's in it for me. I guarantee you they see her as nothing more than a servant and she's supposed to be bringing them something. She should be bringing them coffee or tea or she should be bringing them cinnamon rolls on a platter or it just keeps working its way in there. But at any rate, she's supposed to be coming in there to bring them something. They don't see anything in her hands that resembles a tray. And she comes walking and Jesus is there reclined and she comes walking and Jesus is looking at her and of course he knows what's going on and all of a sudden she reaches out from underneath the robe and here's this little box. She walks over there to the Lord and walks up there behind him and the Bible says and she break the box. All of a sudden in her little hands comes the strength of Samson when he pushed open the pillars and the temple came crumbling down on the Philistine. She crushed that box. And that broken box is the resemblance of the fact that the box is not of the greater value, that the box has to be broken in order for the purest substance to be able to get out. I'm glad she wasn't a Baptist. You say, how do you know? If she was a Baptist, she would have unscrewed the lid. She'd have poured out 10%. <laughs> Amen. 
put the lid back on us and now you be blessed today. <laughs> she was all in. You know what she did? She shattered that box. And as a result, she changed the atmosphere in the entire place. Can I say this to you? When you live and learn the value of a broken vessel, people will despise you. When you abandon your modern theology, when you abandon what people feel is safe, when you step outside the box and learn to walk by faith and learn to listen to what God wants you to do instead of what the world wants you to do, and it doesn't always make sense and it doesn't line up, when your box is broken and you decide to live for Him instead of live for yourself, you know what people do? These are people that are sitting at the table with Jesus. You know what they say to you? They say, man, why did you do that? You you could have done so much for the poor or you could have done so much for industry or you could have done so much for your retirement or you could have done so much for this and so much for that. They seem to despise someone who is all in when it comes to Jesus. Yeah, I don't like communists. And if you were a former communist, please listen to me before you cut me off. But I admire communists. Back in the days when I was growing up, the thing I learned to admire about a communist was is they owned nothing in and of themselves. Everything they had, including their life, their body, their very life's breath, was committed to the cause of communism. And I look at Christians today, and I don't mean to plow too deep here, but you know what I see? Kind of half committed, kind of half broken, kind of 10 percenters, 1 percenters, 2 percenters. I don't find very many saying, hey, listen, man, whatever I got belongs to Him. I'm now bought with a price. I'm going to serve Him. I belong to Him. I don't belong to myself. If He says go, I go. Boy, we're missing that nowadays, at least in the United States. Very few people anymore. Career comes first. School comes first. Marriage comes first. Kids come first. Everything else comes first. And then when a preacher gets up and says, Hey, is your vessel broken? It's like, well, now let's not get carried away. But we will break our vessels to get a trophy on a sports field. And we will offer up our life to defend a military cause for our country and even be separated from our families on a foreign field and run the risk of taking a bullet and giving our life. And yet when the Lord says to you, hey, why don't you go here and why don't you do that? You know, we say, ah, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I can do that. I mean, after all, well, you did it for your country. Well, I mean, I got to be able to take my family. I got to be able to take my friends. And I got to be able to take my property. And I got to be able to do this. Now, if I can do all of that, well, you went over there for the military. But I guess in a matter of what you believe is really the cause, can you see her when she comes in there? I guarantee you she's shaking. I guarantee you she's trembling. Thank you, young man. I'll take that 10%. Thank you. Can you see her when she comes in there? She takes that alabaster box. She probably looks at the lid for a second. She puts the lid back on and she just crushes it. She said, man, this ain't even enough. I'm, I got to give him every bit of this thing. I got to take the vessel that it is contained in and I got to get rid of it. I think she might even be like, you know how you do cake batter? Y'all probably don't do this. In the South... When my wife makes a cake on a rare occasion, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see a big old finger around the bowl. You say, why? That's the goody, man. She uses that beater thing, right? Guess who's going to lick the beaters? You say, yeah, but the, but the eggs are not quite and they had not been cooked and you might get salmonella. Who cares? I'll die happy. Oh, yeah, man. When she makes biscuits, that, do that, row is, that, that, that dough is raw. Before you cook that biscuit, you've got to get you a little pinch of that dough. Just get you a little taste. Oh, man, that sounds terrible. Oh, you ain't lived yet. <laughs> you know what I think she's doing? I think she's raking every, every bit of that off and making sure she gets it on him. The Bible says she wrought a good work on me, not for me. She made him look good. She made him smell good. Do you realize that when your vessel is broken for him, that you make him look good? So what do I get out of it? It doesn't matter what you get out of it. It makes him look good. 
I remember an elderly lady. I, I knew her. I only knew her. To me, I, I called her the crab, and that's a bad thing to do, and I, and I apologize for it. I was a little kid, so understand. Get it in your mind before you get haters now. Listen, I was about nine years old, maybe ten, and this lady, this is back in the days of polio. I don't know if you had that over here, but we had polio over there, and then you had to take a sugar cube with this dot on it and all that kind of stuff. And, and at any rate, I remember this lady. She had had polio, and she had those little crutches that came up to her elbows. And when she would walk, she'd do that, and then she'd lock her braces in this way, and then she'd walk, you know, like this, you know, every time she'd sling that crutch around and, and that kind of thing. And I look at her, for a little kid, you're looking, you're thinking, that's just creepy, man. It just kind of looks strange. I, I shouldn't have been that way, so just give me a second here. But I remember one day my dad said he was at the church and he kept hearing a noise. He thought there was maybe a raccoon or some kind of animal that had gotten into the sanctuary. And so he got slipped out of his office and he went around in there to the big, big, huge sanctuary there. And he's walking around inside there and he keeps hearing this noise. He keeps hearing this shook, 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 shook noise and he hears like a tink or something and he's thinking man that don't sound like an animal and he keeps walking back there and he looks and he sees over here in the corner he sees those crutches there you know I wonder why sister so-and-so's crutches are sitting there and he keeps walking on back there he gets almost to the back of the church and he gets between the pews and he sees her laid out there and she's underneath the pews and she's looking up at him laying on her back this way and she said hey preacher and he said sister what are you doing down there she said, oh, preacher, Mr. Ed, let me in. I hope I'm not in no trouble. I, I, uh, I, 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 I come in and he lets me in the side door, preacher. He said it was okay. She said, okay, well, wh what are you doing? She said, well, preacher, you know, uh, what I do is, is I come in here every other week or so, and what I do is I get my putty knife, and she held it up like that, and she said, and I get my jar, and she said, I go underneath all the pews, and I, I scrape all the chewing gum off of the pews, and... I keep that. She goes, that's my offering for the Lord. Wow. And my dad said, well, I can. She said, preacher, please don't tell him to quit doing that. You take my ministry away from me. You say, what is that? Broken vessel. What does she get for it? I don't know. You'll get to meet her when we get to heaven. Why don't we wait and see? Yeah. She'd be up there, what'd you do for the Lord? And I slid and scunched up underneath the pews on my old crippled up, broke up, polio ridden body and slid on my back and scraped off with a putty knife, a bunch of chewing gum, kept it in a mason jar. And that's what I did for the Lord. It don't seem like much. Old Herbie was in that same church there. Herbie was mentally uh, deficient. He, his elevator didn't go to the top a few, four hours short of a happy meal, however you want to call that. I don't mean disrespect, but I mean just is what it is. And Herbie was a knock-kneed and pigeon-toed man. Thumbs were turned in this way. And uh, his teeth looked like they had socks on them all the time. I mean, just, just and, and I mean, he could talk to you from this far and, and, and you could smell his breath. It was terrible. He would come in. He always sat right here on the second row. Every time, right on the second row. He'd sit right there. Big, huge church there. Herbie sit right there. Herbie get ready to sing. He'd pick up a hymnal. He couldn't read a lick. He'd hold the hymnal upside down. He knew one key off the entire time. <laughs> He sang, man, I mean, every song was the same, and it was, I mean, it was bad, man. I remember one day we were walking out, and Herbie uh, was coming out the back door over there, and he saw me, and he said, Oh, you the preacher boy, you the preacher boy. I uh, Herbie love you like that. And he grabbed a hold of me, and he hugged me. He didn't know how strong he was. I pushed him away. I said, man, get off of me, man, you stink. Oh, about that time, the hand of God reached down and grabbed me by the britches. Literally, the hand of God impersonating my dad. He grabbed me and took me into one of those rooms that you always wonder why the room is there in the vestibule of the church. You're like, I wonder what that room's for. I found out what it was for. <laughs> he very gently, uh, about every third or fourth step, I was touching the ground. My dad was a big man. He was a professional ball player. And so he comes up there and grabs me, takes me in, and sets me down. And I heard that old familiar sound, at least for me. I'm like, I know what's coming now. And I got three sots, man. I mean, I'm going to tell you what, as the old preacher used to say, he laid on the stripes and I saw the stars, boy. And then when he got done with that, I'm, uh, I'm over there, I'm, I'm trying to catch my breath and stuff. And he said, boy, you stop that, I'll give you something to cry for. And I'm thinking, oh, daddy, you already did, you know. And he said, you go out there and apologize to Mr. Herbie. And I said, uh, yes, sir. And he said, your daddy wishes he had a hundred Herbies. I thought, a hundred Herbies? I'm a pastor now. I wish I had a hundred Herbies. 
But at any rate, you know what happened? I went out there and I stood up and Herbie thinks I got in trouble because of him now, see? And now Herbie's crying. And I said, Mr. Herbie, and make, um, you know, my daddy said, that's Mr. Herbie. I said, I'm really sorry. Herbie so jolly. Oh, I me, oh, Herbie did he sort of, now that makes it worse. Now I'm crying again, man. I'm out there bawling and squalling and stuff like that. And Herbie walks out the door and he walked down the side over there. And Herbie, and my daddy had this thing when they got ready to go. My, my daddy would go to him and say, hey, Herbie. He'd say, yes, sir, preacher. He'd say, hey, Herbie, it won't be long. Going to be thumbs up. He'd say, yes, sir, preacher, thumbs up, old Herbie. You know, when you get to heaven, you know, he'd go, thumbs up, old Herbie. <laughs> he goes walking out and walking down the stairs like that. Herbie walked all around Chattanooga up there in Tennessee, and he'd collect newspapers, and he'd have to roll them with his fingers this way, and he'd tie them with string, couldn't use rubber bands, and put them in the top of an old uh, uh, cart, a little ice cream cart, and he'd walk over there to the paper mill, and he'd stand on the scale, and they'd wave him off that and weigh it, and he'd take it off and unload it, and he'd come back and weigh, and it'd be empty now, and they'd give him, and he'd go by the office and they give him his money in a brown paper bag, gave him cash in those days. It was on every other Thursday. And Herbie would go the first on the way home, leaving the paper company, Herbie would come by and stop at the church. He'd stop in the secretary's office, he'd say, where is the point you? And he'd say, Herbie, let me just check and see if he's here. They'd buzz my dad on the wires. He's back there, it was real sophisticated, had a black wire and a red wire running down the hallway and Real sophisticated. My dad said, send him back. I heard him and called for the secretary to come and Mr. Ed, the janitor, to come back there. And they'd come back there and he'd dump out his money on the table there. And he'd say, point ya, how much in my tithe? And my daddy say, now Herbie, you know, your mama's an invalid and your sister's doing all she can. You're on social security. Your daddy's not around anymore. I'm sure the point ya, how much in my tithe? So well, Herbie, you made $110, so your tithe would be $11. He said, I give an offering too? And he said, well, how much you want to give? You want to give a, you want to give a dollar? And Herbie said, yeah, I want to give a dollar. I'll give a dollar. He said, okay, write $12 and put it on. They'd all sign it and seal it, put the rest in the bag and send it with a sheet so nobody thought anything was up. And it comes Sunday, man. I don't know if Herbie changed his clothes or not. He'd have on the same shirt. And that envelope would be right here in the top of his, of his uh, shirt like this. And he'd be waiting for the offering to come around, you know. Couldn't wait for the plate. Couldn't wait for the singing. They just kept waiting for the offering. And when it come time for the offering, you just get the ushers down front to gather and they grab their plates and Herbie he's got it between them fingers just like this he's holding it and he's waiting for the plate to come out there and when the plate would pass he'd look around like this and he'd pow, throw it in that plate and then he'd turn around and go <laughs> and grin if it didn't pop he'd reach in there and get it again one time there was an usher going by there. He put it in there and Herbie went to reach for it. And he stopped him by dad and said, you better not do that. You know, <laughs> let him alone. He said, he'll put it back in there. And he put it back in there. But he wanted it to pop. He could not wait to put that in the, in the plate. One time George Beverly Shea was there. That's a guy that used to sing for uh, Billy Graham. He come by the house. All them people knew my daddy and stuff like that. And, and he come by there and sing. And that place was packed out like sardines in a can, man. You couldn't, you couldn't breathe in there. And I was a little old bitty fellow. I didn't know who these people were. I didn't make no difference to me. It was just people I I walked in my daddy's office. I said, Daddy, they're standing all over this and standing all over that. I can't figure out what in the world all these people around here. One of the deacons walked in and says, Preacher, says, we need to talk to you a minute. And daddy said, Yes, sir, what is it? He says, Well, talking private. He said, No, whatever you got to say, what is it? He said, Well, Preacher, he says, We ain't got standing room only. He said, They're all in the balcony. They're all everywhere. We don't know what we're going to do with them. But, but right there around Herbie, you know where Herbie sits? Well, there's about 10 or 12 spots there. Won't nobody get around him. My daddy said, yeah. And he said, well, if we could move Herbie, my daddy said, if you touch Herbie, we're going to fight. And I was like, yeah, I'm liking this. This is what church is all about for me, man. I'm thinking, yeah, man, I mean, this is going to be. And they, well, now, preacher, you know, no, uh-uh. You leave Herbie alone. I thought, well, yeah, okay. But he just, I mean, he smelled. He was twisted up. He was broken. My dad left that church and years later Herbie was dying. My nephew went over there with them to visit. Herbie was in the hospital. My dad said, hey, you want to go make a hospital call with me? And they went by over there. Herbie's laying there in the bed. He can tell the story better than me. Herbie, what you been doing? I noticed you lost one of your legs here with diabetes and stuff. Oh, preacher, he said, I just been hopping around praising the Lord on one leg. Yeah. Whoo. 
he gets ready to go out of the room. They pray for him and stuff like that. They get ready to go out. My dad telling me the story. He said, we got down, I don't know, just a few feet outside the door. And Herbie at the top of his lung, preacher, preacher, preacher. He comes running back in there. He said, Herbie, Herbie, you can't do that in the hospital. You got to be quiet. He said, preacher, who forgot something? He said, well, Herbie, we prayed for you. We got to go. I got things I have to do and all. I, I, I'm really sorry. He said, preacher, you forgot. Not going to be long, be thumbs up for old Herbie. You say, what is that? Broken vessel? Not need? Pigeon toed, twisted up, hardly enough sense to be able to even get out of school, make a little bit of money collecting newspapers, the off scouring of the world. Every Sunday, rain, sleet, snow, hot, cold, second row. There's Herbie singing every week, every Sunday. You say, what was that? Boy, I look at that thing now and I know why my daddy said, I wish I had a hundred Herbies. You know what I know? I know that boy never did create any kind of trouble or any kind of problem. You say, what did he do? Well, I find it in the text. He just did what he could. You get worried about doing big things all the time. You get worried about being, what am I going to amount to? And how is it going to work out for me? And i got to be the shining star. So many stars in the church nowadays, you can't see Jesus anymore. I mean, people got to use the church for their platform. It's my opportunity to sing. And like it's going to be your uh, uh, doing American or Australian Idol or whatever one of these boys said. That kind of thing. You say, what is he looking for? Broken vessels. Amen. Vessels that are just busted to pieces that are of no value to anybody else. He said, Lord said, I'll take a Herbie. Yeah. I'll take that lady. Miss Love Lady, she sat way back in the back. Just give you a couple of illustrations. I'll come back to the text in a minute. But the pig will wait, right? Yeah. So, I, so way back there in the back, her name's Miss Love Lady. She's one of the ladies that she's real, real thin, skin and bones. I mean, look like, you know, a curtain draped over bones and stuff like that. And she's back there in the back one day. And my daddy's up there preaching. And she gets to preaching, and all of a sudden, or he gets to preaching, she all of a sudden throws her hands up in the air like this. I mean, thank the Lord she didn't stick them out the window of the skin and would have beat her to death, man. I mean, she was one of, the, one of them. I'm giving you a visual picture. Oh, cut it out, man. And she gets up there. I'm a little kid, man. I'm looking at that thing, and I'm thinking, what in the world? And here she comes down the aisleway over there. And she's singing as, as she's coming down the aisle. She's starting to sing a song about the Lord. Satisfied. Can you hear the styrofoam rubbing? <laughs> I am satisfied. I am satisfied with Jesus. And I'm thinking, what in the cat hair? <laughs> Two deacons get up. My dad hits that pulpit so hard there was glass in there to shine up because he has some TV and all that. That's just, I was like, that's pretty cool, man. I mean, he like full force, like bionic elbowed it, man. Glass went shattering everywhere. He said, let her alone. It'd be good for some of you dehydrated Baptists to get some of what she's got. And I'm like, oh, yeah, daddy, I like that, man. All the way down that aisle she comes singing. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied with Jesus. She turns a corner. She comes across the front. She comes all the way down across the front. My daddy just went and sat down on one of them big old chairs they had in those days. He just sat down there and let her go. She come all the way to the end of the thing. She turned around like a military op, made an, uh, a, a turn left, and she started down the aisle that way and saying, you know what I found out? That woman had buried all of her kids. That woman had buried her husband. That woman was in her 90s. She had to have somebody to pick her up, and her idea was just, I want to be in church. You say, what is that? A broken vessel. I'm in a nursing home one day, and just give you another one or two here. I'm just talking about broken vessels. I'm talking about broken vessels that ministered to me. There's an elderly lady, her name was Miss Penny, and they'd put her in the nursing home there because she couldn't get around. She's in a wheelchair for a while, and the whole deal that goes with that. I mean, she's in a diaper like when she's an innocent kid, but she still had her mind pretty good. She's one of those, we'd go over there, and we'd start singing in the nursing home. We'd sing the songs, and I'd preach a little bit in between. Miss Penny, she'd say this. She said, for the Lord's sake, preacher, tell them about hell. 
not the stuff out of the sky. That's the stuff burning underneath your feet where some of you are headed if you don't get saved. But at any rate, you say, you still believe in that? Yeah, I do. That's why I ain't going. You think you're going to air condition it? You ain't. You think you don't believe in it? It don't exist. It, don't exist. it exists. You're there. You're headed there. You might go there before the service is over. You say, why? You don't know when I'll be done. You might fall out from dehydration. And Miss Penny would get up there and she'd say, for the Lord's sake, and I'd say, well, now Miss Penny wants you to hear about hell, you know, so I'll give them a little bit about hell. Y'all doing all right so far? I'll give them a little bit about hell and stuff like that. And Miss Penny would say, for the Lord's sake, preacher, tell them about the love of Jesus. And I'm like, oh, okay. So then I have to change the gear. Well, I went down there to get her one day, and just Tuesday when we went to the nursing home, she wasn't there. And I went to the lady that runs the, the, the ministry there, and I said, hey, where's Miss Penny at? And she said, oh, they didn't tell you, preacher? They done took her to the hospital. She's not doing good today. And I thought, oh, Lord, man, I won't be there if she dies. Man, that's not good. I, I got to go. So I went rushing down to the hospital, left it with somebody else. And I remember walking into the hospital room, and she's laying over there. And at first I thought she was gone. She had on a mask, not one of them little two prongers in her nose, you know. I mean, she had on a full-blown mask. And so you can tell, you know, when that thing gets sort of dusted up because of condensation, if they're still breathing, they wasn't no condensation. And I thought, man, she is gone already. And then all of a sudden I saw it, you know, she let an exhale and I saw it light up and I'm just standing right there and she opened up her eyes. Hey, preacher. I said, hey, Miss Penny. I said, uh, don't look like you're doing good. She said, I'm doing fine. And I said, well, Miss Penny, I'm sure sorry. It looks like you're not feeling too well today. She says, Preacher, I'm doing all right. She said, could you get that Bible over there and read me some? I got the 23rd Psalm, man, you know, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley. And I got cracked up, man, like I swallowed a sock. It just, the whole thing got to me. Here's this old saint going out. Her hair is just as white as it can be. They had to cut it shorter than mine is now because of her being in the nursing home. They can't take care of it and stuff. Some independent Baptist would have had a problem with that and thought she was going to hell because she had short hair, you know, and that kind of thing. It's amazing what they condemn people to hell for. But at any rate, God bless you. But at any rate, um, she's laying there and I'm thinking, man, that thing got me. And the next thing you know, I, I, can't, I can't get the thing out. And then she reaches up there with my hand. I put the Bible on the bed right there. I'm sitting there right next to her. And she gets a hold of me by the hand like this, you know. And she says, uh, now, preacher, I'm going to be all right. I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. Yeah. Well, that made it worse. Now, I'm really crying. She said, you got to get a hold of yourself. <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> what is that, a broken vessel? That woman had led half of an area of town over there we call Arlington here by herself, personal testimony. She had led over half of those people, several hundred people she had led to the Lord. She said, Preacher, you do me a favor? And I said, Yes, ma'am, anything you want, Miss Penny, you just ask. If I can do it, I'll do it. She says, I want you to do my funeral. I said, Oh, you don't want to talk about that? She said, I do too. I said, All right. I said, She said, Now I want you to not do it at our church. I want you to do it at my old church. And I said, well, I'll have to ask the pastor over there and make sure it's okay and, and this and that and the other. She said, you tell him Miss Penny had that as a dying request. I'm sure he'll grant it to you. And I said, well, why do you want to do it over there? We'll be glad to have it at, at our church. She said, because there's a bunch of reprobates over there. That's why. <laughs> I said, oh. She said, they're going to hell from the pew. And I said, Okay. And so I said, is there any special request? She said, yes, sir, there's a special request. I have to tell you what I want you to preach for me. And I said, what is that? She said, I want you to tell them about hail. And I said, well, I'll be glad to. She said, but you know, preacher, you have a tendency to tell people about hail and you don't tell them about the love of Jesus. <laughs> so you make sure you tell them about the love of Jesus. And in a couple of days, she passed on and went to the hillsides of glory. I remember going to that church hundred, several hundred people that were there gathered there. And I'm thinking to myself, man, if you just knew. And I got up there and I started, I said, now, Miss Penny had a dying request. You know, you kind of get a little golf clap like, oh, yes, well, you know, we honor the dead and that kind of a thing. I said, Miss Penny told me to tell you about hell. Man, you could have heard a pin hit the carpet. 
it looked like a can of caterpillar wearing sneakers walking across a Persian rug. It was so quiet in there, man. I mean, I mean, it was quiet, boy. And all of a sudden they're thinking, at a funeral? I said, Miss Penny said that she knows some of you personally and says you're going to hell because you never trusted Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. Amen. And I said, she told me to tell you. Right. And I'm telling you. And boy, you, if looks could kill, man, they were ready to tar and feather me and put me in the box with her, man. <laughs> and then I could hear her almost audibly in the back, for the Lord's sake, preacher, tell them about the love of Jesus. <laughs> and then I said, but there's hope for you. Amen. Amen. I said, Jesus Christ died for your sins according to Scripture and was buried and raised again the third day so you don't have to go there. I said, they asked a president one time, what, did he think of, what does the Bible say about hell? And the president turned around to him and it says, it says you don't have to go there. Amen. That's what you need to know about hell. Amen. Well, we're talking about a broken vessel. The Lord sees what's going on there with Mary and recognizes things are getting sort of stirred up there among the brethren because it just seems to bother the brethren when somebody is completely sold out. Those boys have been with him now for three and a half years and they hadn't learned what that woman learned. You know what, boys? If I could say this to you as candidly and as lovingly as possible, sometimes you can learn some things from women. You ever look at how many times God deals with women because he can't get through thick-headed men? Yeah. Right. Men are always right, men are always tough, men are always in charge and all that other kind of stuff. You realize how many times? I mean, of all the people that the Lord could appear to when he resurrected from the grave, who did he appear to? Can I tell you? A woman. You know who the woman was? It wasn't his mother. It was a woman. He cast out seven demons, a woman of ill repute. You know what that was? That was a woman that was broken. But God did something with her. You know how God rewarded her? Showed up and talked to her. I think about that old woman at the well. I, I'm amazed. You say, well, what about the woman at the well? You know, the green hair man, old mohawk, and tattooed up like we talked about the other day. Got all the, the, the pen and the needles and the stuff in her and all the sticks and all the stuff that goes with all that piercings and everything that would be wild, wild. Not enough pair of clothes to make a pair of britches for a blue jay. And she comes over there and broken all to pieces. You say, how do you know she's broken, preacher? Why, well, she's been with five different men and none of them are her husband. Do you ever wonder why she was with five men? You say, yeah, she's an old whore, an old prostitute, an old ne'er-do-well, an old home wrecker, an old filthy, dirty old girl. The Lord's talking to her. He said, hey, sister, you married? Uh, no, sir. You got a husband? Uh, yes, sir, but he ain't mine. Well said, sister. You must not be an independent Baptist and trying to make it something it ain't. I sure appreciate your honesty. You say, what happened with that broken vessel? God touched her life, and guess what? His light shined through the cracks, and she went into town and turned out the entire town with a broken life and a broken testimony. But you know what you could see? You could see where God put her back together, and God continued to use her. You say, why? God likes broken things. Amen. Your life broken up this morning? I can't tell you all the illustrations that I could give you before I close out things this morning and help you to recognize. Look right there what happens in the passage. And the lady comes up there and she breaks that. The Bible says, I want to make this a memorial to her. I want you to recognize that God is saying that of all the things in the Bible that are important to Him, one of the things seems to stand out, and that is that God likes it when a broken vessel turns their life over to Him and says, let me make you whole again. None of us are without sin. Every one of us is a sin. Now, if you're saved, you're a saved sinner. Amen. But you're still a sinner. Amen. But you know what happens is sometimes we work too hard at being perfect when we don't realize the Lord put a fail-safe plan in place. When you mess up and you fall down and you get broken up like Humpty Dumpty and all the king's men and all the king's horses can't put Humpty Dumpty together in, the Lord says, well, I can do the impossible. I can take somebody's life who's a wreck and somebody's life who's a mess and somebody's life who doesn't amount to anything. They're kicked out with the trash. The Lord don't drive a trash truck. He drives a recycle truck. Amen. Every one of us get recycled. That's pretty good. You can write that one down. <laughs> the Lord's not done with you until you're dead. 
Say, well, preacher, you don't know what I've done and what I've done and this. And I told you about the little girl last night, that old poor old busted up, broken up, skin popper, heroin addict and drug addict and done all kind of horrible, terrible things. And God put her life back together and used her in spite of that. God's not worried about what can I do with you. He took Peter. He denied the Lord and went out there and said, I'm going fishing. The Lord went out on the fishing boat and said, boy, what are you doing out here? And he said, well, Lord, you know, I've denied you and I betrayed you and I've done things I shouldn't have done. And no, you surely you can't use me. The Lord said, what did I call you to do? He said, feed the sheep. He said, feed my lambs, Peter. Feed my sheep, Peter. Feed my sheep, Peter. Lord, can you use a broken vessel? I mean, after I denied you, after I said, though all others will forsake you, yet will not I. I called you a liar, Lord. I said that they would and I did. And you were right and I was wrong. Why would you even want me? The Lord said, you're in a great shape now. How do you know that? John 21. Peter, when you were young, you went where you wanted. You were trying to preserve your vessel. You were afraid to die. You weren't going to do anything but fight. But Peter, when you got old, they'll carry you where you would not. He spake of how Peter should die. Peter said, I'm busted, I'm broken, I'm no good. Pete gets over there. By the time you get about Acts 5, 3, 4, 5 right in there, Peter goes over there and they say to him, now Peter, you can preach, but you can't preach Jesus. And Peter says, can't preach who? They said, Jesus. Oh man, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. I'm, let me just tell you about him. And he starts talking about him. And they said, Peter, if you do it again, we're going to whip you. And he said, do what again? He's talking about Jesus. He said, talking about who? Jesus. Oh man, let me tell you about Jesus. And he starts talking about Jesus. They said, man, we're going to whip you and they whip Peter and boy that old alabaster began that box breaks and that old spike nerd of that changed life begins to seep out through the cracks in that whip and all of a sudden you begin to smell a smell from those whip marks and Peter says to his compadre there he said man ain't this a blessing to take a beating for the right reason what a blessing. You say, why? It busted up the vessel and it allowed the spike nerd to come out and it began to smell I'll give you one last story Jesus Christ gets over there in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's begun to sweat great drops of blood. It's called hematidrosis. It's where the stress is so great that the blood cells begin to break up and the corpuscles begin to shatter. And then all of a sudden your sweat glands get overcome. And the next thing you know, blood's literally coming out of your skin. And he begins to go through that difficult time. And they hang him up there on a rack and they begin to whip him. And all of a sudden, boy, when that whip comes down and that blood begins to flow up there in the battlements of heaven, the atmosphere begins to change. And the Lord said, there's an unusual aroma up here now. He said, what's the aroma, Father? What, what is it you're smelling? He said, I recognize that perfume anywhere. Uh, that aroma is from the box being broken. That's my son. Amen. The rose of Sharon. Amen. The lily of the valley. Amen. Here's how I paint that picture. I got him going down. They've done pulled the robe off of him, put the other one on, and then let it dry, and then yank it off of him, and that blood pouring. I got him walking down there carrying the cross before Simon grabs it and somebody goes, man, what in the world is that smell? I don't know, man. Somebody must have broken a box or something around here. Got that smell, that perfume in it. And the father said, no, that's my son. He's being broken. I'm letting that which was on the outside come out on the inside. Oh, preacher, you don't really believe that. In type, I believe that. And type, you know what I believe when they drove the nails in his hands and the blood splattered all over the place and the corpuscles began to tear loose and he began to go through when those median nerves are struck and he begins to go through convulsions and great pain and stuff like that. There was an aroma there that filled the entire universe, not just the blood, but the smell of a broken box. And the Lord allowed his box to be broken. They sang about it today. His hands were nail pierced. His side was riven. Feet and uh, nails uh, in the feet. Nails in the hands. And spikes up in his head here. And you say, what was that? That's to let the inside out. Let the smell, the aroma, the perfume out. I don't know how you could resist somebody like that. The Lord's not asking you for anything he hadn't done. You say, what is it? He gave his life. Father, do with it whatever you want into thy hands. I'm yours. See, you don't recognize it. When you're going through a breaking process, it's so that the more of the Lord can come out. Right. It makes Him look good. Amen. And you know what you begin to do after you get that picture? You get that in your mind. You know what you begin to do? You begin to thank God for the bad things and the brokenness in your life because you realize that because of that, you can make Him look good because now they can see Him 
and what's you on the inside. Can I ask you this question this morning? I'm going to close and we're going to be done. We're going to eat some pig, have a time of fellowship. But before we break off, can I ask you this? Have you ever felt like you're going through stuff and the vessel's broken and you're no more good and you just should be a castaway? You have something in your life that occurred to you, something that happened in spite of you, something that you wear that label like the woman with the issue and you're thinking they only know me by my disease and you've been bitter about it and you've been angry about it and you've been frustrated about it. Here it's going to get hard now, okay? I'm not trying to get you to come and get you to understand something. Have you ever thanked God for that? And said, Lord, I want to thank you for breaking my vessel. And Lord, could you let me use that for your honor and for your glory? You don't have to be known by your past. You know what you can do? You can say, man, the Lord's in the process of fixing me so that more of him can get out to more people. The value of a broken box. Here's the last thing. She broke it on purpose. The Lord didn't take the box and break it. This is a hard thing for Christians now. Listen, and I'm done, I promise. Thanks for being so kind and listening, but can you just listen for just another moment? In the South, they have some bad habits. Some good, but some bad. And you get preaching along these lines, and here's how the prayer will go. Lord, make me willing to be willing. Well, that's the wrong way. That means he has to superimpose his will over your will. No, you have to have the Gethsemane experience. Remember where we started? You can't think about offering Isaac until you're broken yourself. You know what you have to be willing to say? Lord, not my will, but thine be done. And you have to get over your anger at the Lord for what's happened in your box. And bring your box to the Lord and say, Lord, here it is. I'm breaking it. Because the box is not as important as the substance. And the only way for the substance to get out, the Lord will never force it out of you, is for you to be willing to break the box and say, Okay, Lord, I'm done. I surrender all. That's Herbie. That's the crippled lady in Tennessee. That's Miss Penny. That's Miss Love Lady. That's David Ring. The value of a broken vessel. Heavenly Father, I pray now as we come to a close that you might help us to pause for a minute, that people would not get in a hurry to leave. They might ponder and think, especially if they're here today and they're lost. Lord, they might realize that today might be the last day, their last opportunity to get an opportunity to be saved. But Lord, for those of us that are saved, that we might recognize that we need to willingly bring our boxes here and shatter them. We need our boxes broken. We're working too hard at our own self-preservation. God, would you help us to learn these lessons from these dear old saints that taught us many things by how they lived. Pray God you'll bless this church, bless this pastor and his family and these folks way down south on the other side of the world that you'll help them until we're reunited in the air together, hopefully for your soon coming. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.